Cole said, I see dead people walking around. They don't know they're dead. They're everywhere. Later in this movie, Dr. Crow discovers that he's one of the dead people walking around. And that's not only a movie. I see dead people all the time, and so do you. Not ghosts, but more like I read about Mark Twain saying, he died at 30 and we buried him at 60. The dead people I see are people who have quit learning. A way the enemy comes to steal, kill, and destroy life from you is by stopping you from learning. Don't discover later in the movie of your life that you are one of those already dead people. Get alive and keep it by intentional learning. So today I want to deal with part one of the fifth question of the series that we're doing on Get Alive. Our topic today is, what do I need to learn? I think you will be fascinated at the first thing you need to learn. And oh, by the way, do you see and maybe know some dead people? Probably more than you think. They're everywhere. Man, that's a scary mug. Big 10 foot face on that screen like this. <laughs> a little bit different today. Uh, usually my little videos are humorous and funny, but I think it sort of uh, preempts us for what's coming. It's gonna be very serious today. Uh, I don't want you to go to sleep as he did, <laughs> and I don't want to keep it a secret. I want us to realize and know that there are dead people walking around simply because they've stopped learning. Book of St. Of St. John chapter 10 and verse 10 says this, that the thief cometh not but for to kill and to steal and to destroy. The thief's coming, and we've learned this over the weeks, that the thief's coming. You can't stop the thief from coming. <clears throat> what you can do is be prepared for the thief coming. And the reason that he's coming, the only reason that he's coming, is to steal, kill, and destroy your life. But Jesus says, but I come that you might have life, that you might get life. You might get a life and you might get it, have it more abundantly. One of the ways that the thief's going to come and try to steal and kill and destroy life from you is by, is by not allowing you to learn certain things or <laughs> by allowing you to use things that you have learned. So let me go ahead and give you your fill in if you're, if you're taking notes with me today, and I hope you are. Let me go ahead and get this one across. One of the primary ways the thief comes to steal, kill, and destroy life from us is, is by what we have not learned, and we're going to talk about that next week, or, and this is what we're going to be talking about this week, or by what we have learned. Do you know that sometimes what you have learned is more detrimental to your getting a great life than what you haven't learned? See, what we have learned sometimes will stop us. It'll stop us with our attitudes towards life. It'll stop us with preconceived ideas that we've g developed, our false teachings that we have. It it'll stop us with a way we react to, to certain situations. And, and what we want to talk about today are those things, things that we have learned that are stopping us from experiencing the great life. So what are the things that, first of all, that we must learn if we're going to have an abundant life. So here's number one. Here's the first thing that I think anybody needs to know is to learn to unlearn. I think until we really learn to unlearn things that we've learned through the process of life, we're never going to experience the great life that God has for us. How many has ever done this? Maybe there's an individual or someone that you were attempting to help. You were trying to instill into them or tell them some information that would help them accomplish something that they were attempting to accomplish. But because <clears throat> they would not listen, because of their hard-headedness, they, they would not listen to you and had to do it their way. And sure enough, it did at work. How many of you have ever had ran into somebody like that? Okay, that's, I think that's all of us. Now, now answer this one for me. How many of you are that somebody that had the hard head? Right. Now, see, what you just did is you just admitted that you've allowed things that you thought you knew, that you thought were accurate, that you thought were true, to stop you from experiencing success. That what you thought was right wasn't right and it didn't work. And it cost you time. It cost you uh, maybe some exasperation. It cost you maybe some money. It cost you some life. And so what happened is the thief came and he stole it from you. And so this is what I want us to see. I want us to see that in the big picture, 
in the big picture of life. Multiply that by thousands and thousands of times through your lifetime. And you can kind of see how the enemy will come little by little and steal life from us by what we have learned. And but was it accurate or was it working correctly? So here's another fill in for you. Like it or not, getting the results you want from life will require unlearning Many things. I want you to say many things back to me. Many things. Because most of us just think there's just a little area here or just a little area here. And if I can just figure this part out, then I'm going to have this great life. No, no, no. I want you to hear me today. There are many, many things that we all need to unlearn. So we're going to be talking about that. See, the learning process goes something like this. When, when you start with a clean slate, it's very easy to learn. Think about a child going to school to learn to read. Child goes to school, pure mind, clean mind, no preconceived ideas about reading, no philosophies about the, the, uh, the ways that you do phonics and all of these things. They just go in and they start learning to read. And they get all this information. It's just a clean slate to, to input all of this information in any language, any, any, any program that you want to put in there, phonetical or whatever languages or things that you want to teach that child. They're just wide open to it. You see, it's sort of like a huge hard drive. Now, I'm going to use this analogy to and I'm going to get about 80% of you. Now, I know about 20% of you probably aren't computer illiterate, but I'll hook you up, okay? But I want to talk in this dynamic because I think it will hook us up and we'll be able to get a better picture of what I'm trying and attempting to, to, uh, uh, to relate to you. Now, see, a child is easy to teach. They're really easy to learn. But yet, when we get older, something happens. And it becomes, it becomes more difficult to learn. Now, why is that? I mean, wouldn't you think that it would be the opposite. We, as we get older, learn the importance of learning, the importance of information, but yet it becomes more and more difficult to really learn. Why is that? Well, it's because of that hard drive I'm talking about. You see, when we get older, we start dumping into our hard drive all of this stuff. We start putting in there all of our preconceived ideas, all of our convictions, all of our teachings, whether they're true or not true. What we think is right, whether it's right or wrong. We, we start putting all this stuff in there. And so when fresh information, new information, truthful information comes, we don't want it. We resist it. And the hard drive just doesn't handle it. Now, now I want to try to use this as, as an illustration. You see, what, what happens a, a lots of time is, is we have all this stuff in our hard drives, in our minds. We have like images and these huge video files. Now, if you're computer literate, you know how much, how much space a video file requires. And just to, just to use that, to view that, it uses up so many resources on your computer. But see, what we do as people is we've got these huge images, these huge video files in our minds, these memories. And most of them are negative and bad. And they're running in there. They won't stop running. And every time you see somebody or think of something, this video takes off again. And it uses all the resources in your head and uses up this, all this space in your mind. And it blocks you from getting new information about people and things. Sometimes the hard drive becomes damaged. You know, uh, uh, over time, sometimes a hard drive will come, become damaged in a certain area and it won't receive. You can't write to that particular area. Well, that's what happens with people. Somebody hurt your spirit. They hurt you down deep, and you won't let anybody or anything in there. And now you're resisting new, fresh, and, and good relationships and, and good information. We go through life like this. Sometimes one program will conflict with another program. You know, uh, in, in, a, in, a, in a computer, if, it, if you're running this program and this, this program, sometimes they'll conflict, and it'll, sh it'll crash the whole, the whole system. Now, it happens like that in our lives. Sometimes your marriage program won't run with your child raising program. And your child raising program won't run with your financial program. And then when you try to crank all these programs up together and include into that your church program, something's crashing. And, we, and, and this is what happens to us, you see. Because we've got all this stuff trying to run in there. And sometimes a computer will get a virus. <laughs> That's not good. Sometimes we get that way. We get sick and we shut down learning. We don't want to learn anymore. We don't want to learn how to get healed. We'll just stop learning altogether. And so we do this, you see. And when all of this is happening in a computer, one of the easiest, fastest, and maybe one of the best things to do is to completely re-image that computer drive. It's just like the easiest thing to do. 
you just erase everything and start all over again. Put in a brand new system. Man, that'd be great. Now, I wish I could do that here. You know, give me a new hard drive. Give me a bigger one. I want more RAM. I want, I want, I want this huge hard drive like Einstein had. You know, I want, the, I want a hard drive like Einstein had. You know, wouldn't that be great? Give me the latest updated system. Give me the mind of Christ. Wouldn't that be great if we could just do that, just erase everything? But you know we can't do that. It's not how it works. It's not how it works at all. But we can do maybe the, the next best thing is we can uninstall, you know. <laughs> and, and wouldn't it be great, though, if you could just get a new one? Wouldn't it be great if, if somebody could let, come up to me and say, I'm going to lay hands on you, I'm going to cast out that demon, that old hard drive, and I'm going I'm to put into you, I'm going to impart into you the spirit. And boy, everything be great. You know, we've kind of tried that, and it doesn't work that well. <laughs> so we do the next best thing. What we can kind of do is uninstall. <laughs> and what you've got to realize is that if, you all, if what you already knew worked that well, then you would already be having the abundant life that Jesus came to give us. Right? Hello? And so what we've got to realize is that something that I've got in there is blocking new information, new writing, new programs, whatever that it is that I need to experience the abundant life. You must realize that, that what you don't already know is hurting you. But the reason you don't know it is probably because of something you already do know, or you think you know. Admit it. <laughs> now, <clears throat> I'm not trying to say that you've got to erase everything. I'm not trying to say that your whole mind has got to be flushed, but I'll guarantee you that there are many things in there that if you'll begin unlearning and making space for new truth, you're going to come out much closer to the abundant life than you, than you are right now. Now, um, um, I want to list a few thoughts here. I want to give you just a few things as to some things that we need to unlearn or uninstall. I, I want to give you, now this is in no way a concise or a complete list. This is just some thoughts to get you going, throw out a lot of things to you and a lot of thoughts to you. So, so here we go. Let me give you a couple. Um, actually, just three, but, but they're, they're big, okay? The first one, the first thing that we need to unlearn is unlearn negative attitudes. And that's a great place to start. And the reason that we need to start there is because that's where Jesus started. When Jesus was teaching the Sermon on the Mount, he started with attitudes. Matthew chapter 5, he starts, he goes to teach on the Sermon on the Mount, and the first thing he begins talking about is what we call be attitudes. He says, if you're going to enter the kingdom, if you're going to enter the, the abundant life that I come to give you, then here's where you got to start. And he gives us a list of attitudes that we need to have. So let, let me just give you the first one and sort of paraphrase it to make it work with what we're talking about here. It's in Matthew chapter 5 and verse 3, and it says this, Blessed are the poor in spirit. For there's, it, there's is, would you say is? Not going to be. There's, there is, there's, for there's is the kingdom of heaven. Now, 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 let me paraphrase that for you. He says poor in spirit or the empty in spirit or the clean in spirit. This is, this is what he's saying. So let me paraphrase this for you. He says, blessed are those with a clean hard drive, with a clean mind. <laughs> for, for they will experience the kingdom of God and get a life. How many of you know, except you become as a little child, you can't enter? Except you get some of that adult stuff out of there. Some of that stuff that over the years you've put in. Until you get some of that out of there, you're never going to have the life that Jesus wants you to have. <laughs> uh, what are some foundational attitudes that, that you need to work on? What are some foundational attitudes that you need to uninstall? I think the fastest way that I saw some of my foundational attitudes that I needed to uninstall was by looking at how I viewed the world, my world view. Uh, let, let, me, let me try to, try to explain to you what, what I'm saying because when I get the big picture of how I, over, how I look over the big picture, then it gives me a closer look at how I approach my life. Uh, a question that you probably could start with is the one that I kind of started with is this one. Do you see the world as a great place? or as a place needing punishment and destruction. Now, your learning has brought you to where you feel one or the other. 
So how do you, how do you see the world? See, I had to unlearn that one. Here's what I'm trying to say. When, when I began preaching and teaching and doing what I do, when I began doing this, I was burning it up, man. I was burning the world up. I was destroying all those sinners. I was burning them to a crisp, man. I felt like that's what God's plan was because that's what I was taught and that's what I learned. Now, as I began to read the Bible for myself, I found something out. And it's, a, and it's in a passage, it's in a verse that we all know and quote. You could, you could help me quote it. In fact, I want you to. It's in John 3, 16. For God so hated the world that... that God so hated the world that He sent His only begotten Son that... Through him, it might be destroyed. Let's quote it correctly. For God so loved the world that he gave his only begotten son, that through him, the world might be saved. Might be saved. You see, by my teaching, it's destruction, and, and, it's, and, it's, and it's consuming in this fire, and, you know, atomic bombs and all that stuff going off. By my teaching and thinking that, I was saying that what Jesus came to do failed. That Jesus was a failure, because through him, it might be saved. That one thought, that one adjustment in my attitudes, in my approach to life, and the way I, my basic attitudes changed my entire life. It's because of that I'm standing here. It's because of that I'm doing what I'm doing. That one attitude. And you'll never know. If you just you change one approach of, or an attitude to your approach to life, how, how big of a difference it'll make. Let me, let me give you a few more ideas and thoughts here. And of course, at, every, at the end of every point that I attempt to make, I want to give you some questions to help you ponder it. Is the world full of opportunities or full of problems? How do you see it? Uh, do, do different people with different skin colors and languages and cultures threaten you or intrigue you? Do, do you see them as a problem or as somebody needing salvation? Somebody you can help or somebody you want to get away from? Does the world hold great things ahead for you or only more problems and difficulties? What's, what's your tomorrow going to be? Uh, are you prejudiced? What are your attitudes toward mercy for people who injured you? <laughs> what, what is your attitude toward making peace with your enemies? What is your true attitude about hungering and thirsting for God? Your true attitude, not what you say. Do, do you read your Bible? Do you pray? Do you, do you fellowship with believers? What, what do you do? What, that shows you your true attitude. Maybe some things that you need to unlearn. What foundational attitudes do you need to unlearn? And when you get, really get true with those, you'll begin to get your attitudes and maybe do some unlearning and some relearning according to the Word of God. So that's number one. You've got to look at your attitudes, I think, because that's where Jesus began. Then number two, we'll give you a second one. Unlearn problem emotions. Problem emotions. Now, <clears throat> often... What we do in life is we carry problem emotional responses. Hear how I'm saying it. Problem emotional responses through life with us. They get on us early and we go through our whole lives fighting with them. Problem emotional responses. Let me give us one that we can all basically relate to. One that I do especially. How about anger? Let's see. Uh, let's see. Uh, we laugh at movies like uh, Anger Management. Or we laugh at jokes made about anger management. But it's not funny when you have to deal with unmanaged, when you're forced to deal with unmanaged anger. Even if it's in you, the one that's having the anger problem, or the people around you, it's not funny for them either. You see, that one thing that I had to unlearn, I think, saved this ministry. I think had I continued on with my anger response, that it would have terminated my success. You see, it's not the emotion, and I want to make sure I'm clear on this. It's not the emotion. God gave you your emotions. God gave you the emotion of anger to process with. How many know that God got angry? He got so angry at Moses. He got so angry with the children of Israel. He said, I'm just going to wipe them all out. I'm going to burn them all up. <laughs> but then he said what? No, I'm going to repent. See, the, the, the purpose for anger is to cause you to process. Why am I angry? What did they do? How can I help them? How can I keep from this happening again? Let me show you this in the Scripture. It's not the emotion, it's the response. Look at this in Ephesians chapter 4, verse 26. It says, be angry. Now, is that what the Bible says? Does the Bible tell you to get angry? 
Be angry. That's not the problem. The problem is the response. Be angry, but don't sin. Is that what it says? You see, the response to anger for so many people is sin. You go out of control. You go into rage. You can take it down. When, when, you, when, you, when you go into anger like that, you, you, you lose it. You start using profanities and throwing things and cussing and, and saying mean, hurtful things to people. You can even turn violent. It's not, it's not the emotion. It's the response that we have to unlearn. And until you unlearn it, God's going to con t continually allow you to be st your life to be stolen by the enemy. The enemy is going to continually come and steal, kill, and destroy life from you until you handle the emotional response to, until you handle correctly the response to the emotion. No matter what, re no matter what emotion. It is. Let me give you just a few more. How about fear? Did, did God give you the emotion of fear? Yes, but did He give you the spirit of fear? See, God didn't give you the spirit of fear. Where spirit comes on you and controls you. Uh, do, do people fear you? Does failure fear, cause you to fear? How about another one? How about, how about the emotion of anxiety? Does God want you to kind of get anxious about a few things? <laughs> but but when, when, you know, when, when you get anxious so badly that your blood pressure shoots out your eyeballs, there's something wrong. <laughs> Hello. See, we, we got, we've got to learn to control the emotion, the response to the emotion, not the emotion itself. There's some things that God, that God hates. And that's an emotion. Does He hate sin? But does He hate people? You see, it's the emotional response that's the problem. So here are some questions for you. Do, do you have a problem with emotional responses? How about a problem with fear? Do you have a problem with emotional anxiety, with, uh, with, uh, with the emotion of anxiety? How about the emotion of hate? See, until you learn this, the thief's going to, until you unlearn, until you learn what I'm saying and learn how to unlearn, <laughs> then the thief's coming and he's going to steal, kill, and destroy life from you. And the faster you learn it, the quicker you're going to get to the abundant life. All right, that's two of them. Uh, we could go on and on and on. The list that we could make of things that we need to unlearn could go on and on and on. How, how, about, how about just throwing this one out? How about a person, and, and I know nobody's here like this, but, but say, say a person who has to inflict their opinion into everybody's business. No matter what's being talked about or who's talking about it, this particular person has to inflict their opinion. See, they need to unlearn that and learn to shut their mouth. I said that with a smile on my face. Did you see that? <laughs> and some of us need to learn. We don't have the solution to everybody's problem. And we need to learn to zip it. And what about, what about this one? What about, what about somebody that's, 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 con, that's continuously critical? They've learned to be critical. They need to unlearn that and find something to give people praise about. We could go on and on and on. How about, how about false teachings? We need to unlearn some false teachings. And I could give you a whole list there that I've unlearned. But we need to unlearn false teachings. And we could go on and on and on. But there's one more that I think is major. And I want to spend the rest of our time discussing this particular one. So here's the third one that I think is so important to, to get a handle on it to look at. It's unlearn negative family origin. Oh, say that back to me. Unlearn negative family origin. Say it. Unlearn negative family origin. Now what am I talking about? <clears throat> so much of what you carry through life with you is what originated in your family of origin. And we, and we carry these things, things through life with us. We pick up stuff from our families. Uh, much of it, much of it before you can even talk. You, you, you experienced, you learned love or the lack of it before you could say the word. You should have learned from your family of origin uh, security and safety. Uh, you, you should have learned belonging from your family of origin. Uh, you, you should have learned proper behavior from your family of origin. You should have learned some very good stuff from your family of origin. Hopefully you did. But we've got to be smart enough to realize that we also learned some very bad stuff from our family of origin. And, and until we learn to unlearn those things, it's going to keep on going. And I'm going to show you this in just a second. You see, here, here's the deal. Say, say for example, that a, that a person... 
is an angry person, has a, has a, 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 emotional, a negative emotional response to anger or any, any emotional response, say, say a person deals with that. Do you know that most of the time you can look back at your family of origin and find where you learned that? Let's use another. How about finances? So many people struggle with finances. But do you know what? If you'll look back at your family of origin, you'll probably learn how you learned to handle money. Uh, how about, how about, see, your, your initial worldview, how you approached the world, how your, whether you thought it should be destroyed and burned up or, or whether you thought it was a great place, initially came from your, your family of origin. You, it originated there. How you think originated there. How about, uh, how about this one? So your, your proper, the way, the way it originated now, hopefully some of us have changed <laughs> about this one, but, but whether you're a Democrat, hope you unlearned that one, or a Republican, are uh, independent. <laughs> I'm kidding. I don't care. What, don't. Um, you probably learned your initial positioning by your family of origin. That's how your parents thought. So you thought that was just the right way to do it. Um, addictions. How about abusive, abusive things, abusive uh, men or abusive women even. They, if you look back, you'll usually trace that back to the family of origin. It originated there in them. Addictions. Go back. You see, and, and, we, and we carry these things through life. And I want you to hear this. I want you to really hear what I'm trying to say. You carry these things all of your life unless you unlearn them. And, and, and I want you to really get this point, this one right here, is, is that you say you will either build on, you'll build on the good things that you learned in your family of origin. You'll go through your whole life building on the good things you learned in your family of origin, or you'll spend your whole life struggling with and trying to get over the negative things that you learned in your family of origin. They'll, they'll plague you all your life. And so we've got to come to a place where we learn to unlearn them. Now, we don't get it. You see, I'm, all, I'm asked all the time about generational curses. This, this is really a fascinating topic, obviously, to people. But, but you see, but, but, but this, is, this is how this generational curse thing, and I'm going I'm to touch this in just a second for us. But you see, God's dealing with the nation of Israel. And he's talking to them, and he's saying, listen, he, listen, guys, he says, I'm very jealous, and I don't want you worshiping any other gods. I don't want you bowing down to anything. I don't want you bowing down to habits, or, or I don't want you ba bowing down to addictions, or, or to anger, or to emotions, or, or to attitudes. I don't want you bowing down to any of these things. I don't want to be gods to you. And, and I want you to see what he says. It's in Deuteronomy chapter 5 and verse 9. It says this, Thou shalt not bow down thyself unto them, nor serve them. For I, the Lord... Thy God, I'm a jealous God. God doesn't like sharing. God doesn't, doesn't like sharing your affections. And he says, I'm a jealous God. Now watch this. Visiting the iniquities, visiting the habits, visiting the attitudes, visiting the uh, uh, addictions and, and, and the negatives, visiting those things, those iniquities <laughs> of the fathers upon the children Watch this now, until the third and the fourth generation. What does, what does that mean? It means if your daddy struggled with something, most likely you're struggling with it unless he unlearned it. And then your children are going to struggle with it unless you unlearned it. And your children's children are going to unstruggle it unless your, ch your child unlearns it. It's going to go on three, four generations. Now watch the rest of this verse. Watch the rest of this verse. <clears throat> let, me, let me start over again. Visiting the iniquities of the fathers upon the children and the, to the third and the fourth generation of them what? That hate me. Of them that hate me. This is, this is who this comes on. Of them that hate me. Now, I, I want to I differentiate for you hate and love here in, in the mind of God. Okay? And it says here, and now let, read the rest of the verse. And showing mercy unto thousands of them that love me. And... And what is and in the English language? A, a conjunction. So and, so that part connects with the next part, correct? Uh, those that love me and, conjunction, and keep my commandments. So you can't separate love and the conjunction hooks those things together. You can't say I love God and not keep his commandments. Jesus says if you love me, you will keep my commandments. You will obey my commandments. You see, so you can't disconnect those things. If you love God. 
you're going to find his ways of doing it, and you're going to unlearn those negatives, and you're going to relearn the positives, and you're going to stop it. See, we're told like this, that when we come to Jesus, all this stuff stops, right? You come to Jesus, pray this prayer, go to church, and all those bad things are going to stop happening in your life. I'll ask you a question. Be honest. How many of you had that happen to you? How many of you, when you prayed that prayer, your whole life got perfect? But how many of you have learned that if you unlearned some things and did it God's way, that it did stop? There you are. See, it's not going to stop until somebody unlearns it. It's going to keep on going. Somebody loved God enough to stop it. And it stopped right there and wasn't handed on to the next generations. These things come down the pipe to us. The thief comes. But we should be sharp enough through Jesus Christ to stop it. Here's your fill-in. Well, actually, questions. What iniquities are you allowing to continue in your children by your not unlearning? People ask me all the time about this generational curses. You don't have to put up with it. You might have an abundant life. You don't have to. But if you'll take his word and apply it to your life and love God by keeping his commandments, you can stop it right now. I want to talk uh, about a man in the Bible who's a guy in the scriptures, and uh, <clears throat> he had to totally re-image his hard drive. <laughs> he had to totally unlearn and relearn everything, and he had to even get an updated operating system. And, and, and he had to do it. And we know this individual as the Apostle Paul, who is the greatest apostle in, in the Scriptures. He, uh, he, he wrote two-thirds of the, of the New Testament, most of the New Testament as we know it. Paul wrote it. We know him as the Apostle Paul. He's great. He was so successful. Started churches, did, won so many people to the Lord Jesus Christ, was so successful. But, you know, he didn't start off as Paul. He, he began as Saul of Tarsus, a Pharisee. And he was the son of, Phar of Pharisees. I mean, his, the pipe coming down the line to, to him was nothing but Pharisees. He had, he had some very serious <laughs> family origin deals that he had to deal with. He, he learned the law and he learned life by the way his dads and granddads and granddad dad dads had done it. And it came down into him. That's how he did life. And he had some other issues. He had some serious issues concerning attitudes and, and serious issues about emo emotional responses. He hated Christ followers. He hated them. That's a bad emotional response, right? That's a bad emotion. And, and he, he, he hated them so much that he got violent. He stoned them to death. And that's what he learned. He learned that, that Christ followers were, were heretics in a cult. That's what he learned. And then one day, on the road to Damascus, he met Jesus Christ for himself. Um, and he discovered that what he learned was inaccurate. And that he had to unlearn so he could learn some new stuff. And actually, the Christ followers were not, <laughs> the Christ followers were not cults and, and, and heretics, actually, they are what he became. He became one. He had to unlearn that. He also had to unlearn his whole message. See, he had to unlearn about the, the world being destroyed because in his mind and what he was taught was the Messiah was going to come and he was going to create this huge army and they were just going to walk all over the earth and just destroy all the Gentiles. And if you didn't believe like Paul and like the Pharisees, then you were a goner. That's what he taught and that's what he believed. He had to unlearn that. He had to unlearn that the kingdom is not something that's coming. The kingdom is. If he, he realized this, he said, you know what? If, if the Messiah came, king, if the Messiah king came, then that would mean that the Messiah's kingdom came. Because you can't have a king without a, a kingdom. And so he began to declare the kingdom of God. Let me show you this in Acts chapter 28, verse 31. Boldly and without hindrance, he preached. He declared. That's what that word means. He declared the kingdom of God and taught about its king and taught about the Lord Jesus Christ. He learned. He had to, he had to unlearn all that teaching 
and so he could have room enough to receive and accept the truth. Also, Saul had to unlearn about the Jews. See, until that particular time, he, to him, the Jews were this special bunch of people, God's favorites. He found out he had to unlearn that because after Jesus comes, everybody's God's favorite. Every, he loves everybody the same. Let me read it to you. It's in Galatians 3.28. For there is neither, what, Jew nor Greek or Gentile. There's neither Jew nor, nor Greek, slave nor free, male nor female. For you are all one in Christ. See, Saul, Saul not only had to unlearn about the, the heretics and the Christ followers and, and unlearn about the kingdom and, and unlearn about the Jews, but he also had to unlearn about women. He, he had learned that women were inferior. He needed to unlearn that. See, what, 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 what a, a, a Pharisee was taught to pray, had learned to pray this prayer. Thank you, God, that I'm not a Gentile and that I'm not a woman. He learned to pray that prayer. He had to, un in fact, there's not an area of his life he didn't have to unlearn many things. That's what I'm trying to tell you today. See, the Apostle Paul who once was Saul, got a brand new operating system. He got a brand new character. He once operated as Saul of Tarsus, but he got a new operating system of Paul the Apostle. Right. And his everything changed. He reformatted, he re-imaged, he un uninstalled and reinstalled the correct programming so that he could go on with his life and become the most successful of all the apostles. See, he was successful because he unlearned. And here's a big one for you. It was by his unlearning that he finally realized why he was born. It was by his unlearning that he finally fi figured out why he was on the planet. You will never figure out why you're on the planet unless you unlearn some things. You're never going to have the life that God wants you to have, the abundant life that Jesus came to find for you and help you find, unless you unlearn some things, many things. You know, the New Testament that we now have, is because Paul, or Saul, of Tarsus, unlearned what he had learned. Uninstalled it so that he could learn some new things. And now the New Testament that you and I have, that we build our lives on, build our churches on, build our families upon, came because Saul unlearned. I want to make this as relevant as I possibly can to us. And I think I can with most of us adults who are 25 years or older that's been going here for any length of time. <clears throat> Since LifeGate Church is only a little over 20 years old, I think I can make this very relevant to you and, and, and let, you, let you see what I'm trying to say here so that you can make this impactful into your life. You see, <clears throat> you, could have, you could have said this, my mama was a Baptist or Methodist or Presbyterian or Catholic, whatever. My daddy was a Baptist, so bless God, I'm going to be a Baptist. That's what I'm going to do. I, uh, I don't want you fooling around with my teachings. I want to believe that the world's going to be destroyed. Don't mess with my attitudes. I like me just like I am. Don't fool around with my emotions. Don't touch it. I like me just like I am. But that's not what you did. You're here. Why? Why are you here? Because you wanted more. You, you, you felt like there was more. You, you wanted more of, of the Scriptures, understanding of the Scriptures. You wanted more of life. You wanted more of God. And you felt like this would be a great place to come and learn how to do that. And so every week you come and you position yourself so that I can challenge your thinking. I challenge your learning. I challenge what you think. I challenge your attitudes. I challenge your emotions. Every week. And so what we go through now doing is unlearning so we can all learn together. And what upsets us now is that we can't get other people, am I, am I accurate? We can't get other people to come unlearn with us and learn together. That's what upsets us. Am I accurate? Am I accurate? Right. Yeah. But you see, if you'll take that principle and you'll apply it to every single area of your life and unlearn the negatives, unlearn the outdated, Unlearn those negative attitudes and, 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 the, and those negative emotional responses and unlearn those, those things that we picked up back from our family. Unlearn those things. 
you're going to find the abundant life. But until you do, it's not going to happen. You're going to stay just like you are. Because the way you're thinking got you where you are. And until you unlearn and learn some new stuff, you're not going to experience the abundant life that Jesus came to give you. And what's the worst part is you're going to pass this on to your children and to your grandchildren until somebody loves God enough to unlearn it. Let's pray. Father, thank you. Thank you for your word that challenges us. Thank you for Jesus who challenged us. Thank you for, for the Apostle Paul who challenged us. Thank you, Lord. Uh, heads bowed, eyes closed. You would say, Delbert, you know, I have learned there are things I need to unlearn. And I'm learning that the sooner and the faster I can unlearn some things, that the quicker I'm going to get to the abundant life that Jesus has for me. And so what I really need now is to be more aware of those things that I need to unlearn. I need God to help me and show me the things that, that I need to unlearn. If, if that's you, would you raise your hand so we can all pray together? Would you raise your hand if, if, if you want to unlearn some things so that you can relearn some things? Hands all over the place. Amen. Thank you, Father. Father, I do, I pray every single person who raised their hand that, Father, you'll help them, show them the things they need to unlearn so they can uninstall and then reinstall proper programming and proper thinking and proper learning. Father, that we can get that stuff out of us so we can get the good stuff in and that we can experience the abundant life that Jesus came to help us find. Head still bowed and eyes still closed. Now, maybe you are far from God or maybe you've never received him as your Lord and Savior. Listen, you, you, you don't have a chance because you can't, you can't uninstall. It's only through Jesus that you could do this. He says, the thief's coming. He's going to steal and he's going to kill and he's going to destroy stuff from you. He's going to take your life from you. But through me, by me, I come to give you life and give it to you more abundantly. I am the way. Listen, this is the only way. You're going to struggle right with life like, just like you are until Jesus Christ becomes your Lord and your Savior. He died so that you can have an abundant life. This is what it's all about. So if that's you today, and you say, you know, Delbert, I want that. I want, I want to have a great life. I want to have re receive Jesus Christ as my Lord and Savior. Not so I can just go to heaven when I die, but so that I can experience the wonderful things of life right now. I want that in my life. I need to get closer to God. I need to receive him as my Lord and Savior. And I need to let him be. I need to love God enough that I'll stop this stuff from, from going on to my children. If that's you, would you raise your hand? Let me pray for you right here. I see your hand in the back. Any others? I see a hand in the back. Another hand in the back. Another hand right here in the front. Any others? Any others? Any others? Any others? I see your hands. Thank you, Father. Father, thank you, Father. I want to pray for you. Father, just thank you for them. Thank you for these people, Lord. They're, they're smart enough and brave enough to, to acknowledge, Lord, that, that they're making a mess of the things. But, Father, through, the, through, through Jesus, they can have salvation, not just to, to go to heaven when they die, but, Lord, they can experience abundant life right now. So, Father, I pray right now for them. I want everybody in here to pray this. Every single person, those that raise their hands, and, and every single person, Lord Jesus, come into my heart. Forgive me of my sins, which means release me from the iniquities of my past so that I can experience the abundant life now. I receive you as my Lord and Savior. In Jesus' name I pray. Amen. Would you give the Lord a shout and a hand clap? Yes. Amen. Yes.